So, dear future prime ministers, <laughs> 10 years ago, I had given a talk to students in Texas, and afterwards I said to my wife, this is the last talk I'm ever gonna give. And she wondered why, and I was serious. I said, on the one hand, I'm starting to lose my memory. On the other hand, I'm starting to fear introductions. Now you see why I fear introductions, <laughs> and very soon you'll see why I worry about my memory. <laughs> so our granddaughter, Ella, is here tonight, 13 years old, and a few weeks ago, as we were doing homework, she suddenly asked if she could ask me a serious question. She said, if you were to die this week, what is the advice you would have wished you had given me? And I keep thinking about that because in a couple of months, I've been asked to go back to the Gates Foundation and speak at their annual meeting. And they will have 1,500 employees at this meeting. And I keep asking myself, if I would die that week, what is the advice I wish I would have given to those 1,500 employees and you are the jury because I'm going to try out the things that I would like to say 10 things in 10 minutes that I have with them and the first one is pay attention mindfulness it shows respect and you are going to as important people in your country have people come to you continuously trying to get your time to get you to help raise money, to be part of their advice team, and show respect. Listen to them and see what you can do. I was thinking about a public health worker from some years ago. He told me he went to college in Iowa and his roommate was from Australia. The roommate was asked to give talks at schools and at uh, service clubs and so forth. And at first he found it very exciting and then he found that he had trouble actually focusing. That it was the same thing, repeated. Well, one night he was asked to speak at a Baptist church and when he finished, a man stood up and asked, are there many Baptists in Australia? This student from Australia, in his mind heard him say, are there many rabbits in Australia? <laughs> And he said, good Lord, they're the national nuisance. <laughs> he said, we hunt them and shoot them and poison them. <laughs> but he said, they just keep reproducing. <laughs> so pay attention. Number two, I'm going to say avoid certainty. Richard Feynman, the physicist, said, certainty is the Achilles heel of science. And it's the Achilles heel of religion. And it's the Achilles heel of politics. Don't be certain about things. When I was going to school, we had on the wall a periodic table. And it was so certain. The atomic weight for hydrogen was one. The atomic weight for oxygen was 16. And I don't know if you've looked at an atomic, uh, a periodic table in recent years, but it turns out the atomic weight for hydrogen is now listed as 1.0094 plus or minus point something or another. For oxygen, it's 15.999 plus or minus. So that even that is no longer exact. And Richard Feynman talks about the time when he was shaving in the morning and it suddenly occurred to him that the explanation always given by physicists for why left and right were reversed in the mirror simply could not be true or top and bottom would be reversed. And so suddenly he saw that for the first time and he couldn't be certain and he figured out what in fact was happening. 
So even when you hear something, you would think, well, that's pretty certain. Well, we were listening to a program on the radio called On Being, and a man was saying, you can't even be certain of what you hear. He said, I went to a dinner party with my wife recently, and we met a new couple. When we got home, I asked her, so what did you think of that man? And she said that he certainly doesn't undress the maid by himself. And he said, that made no sense to me at all. And so he started questioning her and found that what she had actually said, he certainly doesn't underestimate himself. <laughs> but he said he still heard it the first way because that's the way he heard it. So avoid certainty. And I wonder if a lot of the negative perceptions about uh, global health are due to other people who are not being mindful. I hear all the time, all of this money going into global health and what has it done to change health in the world? We still have all this suffering. Or America first. Why should we worry about other countries? Some believe attention to global health actually makes things worse. And I remember many years ago during the smallpox campaign giving a talk on smallpox and a man stood up afterwards and he said, don't you understand that smallpox is nature's way of controlling population? And that you're doing the wrong thing by vaccinating people. And I asked him, have you ever had a smallpox vaccination? He said, of course. I said, well, you've disqualified yourself for using that argument. Having listened to all of these objections to global health, uh, some of them are actually worth listening to and some of them aren't. But the reality is it's impossible to actually get the picture of how much health has improved in recent decades. In this country, for an entire century, our life expectancy increased seven hours a day. Seven hours a day for a century. Now it's gone down in the last two years and people think because of the opioid uh, crisis. But think of that for a century, seven hours a day. I used to think of how nice it would be if I didn't have to sleep. Well, that's the equivalent of not having to sleep to get seven more hours uh, a day. Smallpox killed 300 million people in the 20th century. And now no one has to worry about that. Guinea worm has gone from millions of cases a year down to a handful. Polio, we used to have 50,000 cases of paralysis in this country every year. And now we're down to two or three countries and a handful of cases. River blindness, which used to make people blind in their 40s and 50s in large parts of Africa, and that is now uh, disappearing. Measles used to kill three million children a year, and then it went to two million and one million, and now we're down to about 100,000 a year. Still too many. But think of the, uh, the uh, changes that have taken place. And look at how we're now looking at social determinants of health and poverty, the role of poverty. So we can't be satisfied, but we can certainly be energized. And the argument, by the way, is incorrect, that saving children's lives makes the population problem worse. And all you have to do is think about the places in the world where population is growing the fastest are always the places that have the highest infant and child mortality. And the countries that have the slowest growth have the lowest child and infant mortality. So it's, we've known this for 25 years and still the argument is used, don't listen to the argument, don't have it become a factor in your life. But there's also a moral obligation. Some years ago, the World Bank had a debate on whether they should fund polio eradication or not. And I was asked to participate in the debate. I, did, I don't like to be in debates, but I decided it's the only way I'm going to really understand what the arguments are against this. And one argument that was very telling was from an African who said, this is neocolonialism, that Europe and the United States comes and tells us how we should be spending our health money and we don't have the opportunity to make that decision. I understand that argument. 
And so I used to counter it Gandhi, who said, my idea of, uh, of, um, of how we have equity is uh, the golden rule, is that I should not be able to enjoy things other people can't enjoy. And I said, if I can enjoy the fact that my children and grandchildren are not susceptible to polio, I have an obligation to make that available to all parents and grandparents. So beware of certainty. Re-examine every truism. When the Warren Buffett decided to give lots of money to the Gates Foundation, billions of dollars, to increase their portfolio, I was asked at the Gates Foundation, what's the biggest risk we take if we accept this money? And I said, I think the biggest risk might be certainty. Because if you have money and other people want it, they listen to you. And the more they listen to you, the more you think you're right. And pretty soon you become very certain that you're right, and they entertain that as being correct. And so certainty is the thing that we have to be careful about. Number three, seek satisfaction. I tell students it's not likely that you'll get rich in global health, but it's not even likely that you will be thanked. And I tell them about Pearl Kendrick, and most of them have never heard that name. Pearl Kendrick is the person that developed pertussis vaccine. And when she died in 1980 in Michigan, the dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan, a man by the name of Dick Remington, wrote a eulogy. And he said, hundreds of thousands of people are walking around enjoying life, enjoying a vocation, enjoying their family. And he said, can you name one of them? Hundreds of thousands because of her, can you name one of them? He said, I can't either. And yet she was so certain about what she had done, she found satisfaction in that and did not need to be thanked. Number four, find mentors. And what I hope to do in Seattle when I talk to this group is to describe to them that 60 years earlier, I was a student at the medical school, I could not find two people on the faculty with an interest in global health. But I did find one. And his name was Ray Ravenholt. He had a global perspective. He later became head of family planning for USAID. He was very persuasive. He quickly increased their budget from $2 million a year to $100 million a year. And then I'm going to say, I started working for him 60 years ago. And he said, if you're really interested in global health, there aren't many pathways. But he said, go to CDC and get in the Epidemic Intelligence Service, and you will find people that know about global health, and you'll make lifetime friends. And he was absolutely right. But then what I'm going to say is, when he finished with USAID, he went back to Seattle to retire. And then I'm going to say, and he's in the room right now. And Ray Ravenholt in his 90s, I hope will stand up and get a ovation from this group for being a mentor. So find mentors who do things that you want to be able to do yourself and then become a mentor yourself. Number five, continue to be learning, not learned. Learned people are quickly bypassed because their information is old. But continue learning and do the same thing you're doing right now. Use this to try to improve your philosophy, to improve your skills, and to improve your knowledge. Number six, think globally. Einstein once said nationalism is an infantile disease. He said it's the measles of mankind. And when you think about it, every place on earth is both local and global. So it doesn't matter what you're doing, you're already in global health. But it's not just a geographic concept. Uh, think globally in terms of knowledge. Professor Pelligan, the late Professor Pelligan from Yale, used to say that the difference between good scholarship and great scholarship is that with good scholarship, you can kind of figure out where the person went to school, who their mentors were, what they were studying, and it led to good scholarship. But he said, for great scholarship, it depends on how much do they know outside of their field. Global 
wisdom. Number seven, think long term, not in years, but in centuries. And be asking yourself, what will happen in 300 years? Many of you probably grew up, as I did, with the Good Samaritan story. And when the teacher would ask, uh, who is your neighbor, you'd get good points by saying the homeless or someone in another country and so forth. Never, as I grew up, did I ever hear someone say, my neighbor might be someone who was not to be born for 300 years. And if you see that as your neighbor, then it changes the way you operate. My wife used to teach preschool, and once a year I would go to her class with a white coat and a stethoscope and a notoscope and x-rays, and we'd talk about health. One year, a four-year-old girl asked me a question, and I thought to myself immediately, this is not an accidental question. Because she asked me, do doctors have bosses? I mean, think of that. And so I said to her, well, the good ones do. Their patients are their bosses. And then a few weeks later, I was doing a seminar at UNICEF. And I used that illustration. And I asked, who are the bosses of UNICEF? And they quickly came to the conclusion, every child in the world is their boss. And I said, that's absolutely true, but it's inadequate. Because your bosses are every child living in the world today and every child who will ever be born in the future. And if you see that, then you will be making the right decisions. So be thoughtful about the world that you're creating for the future. They've given you their proxy, and they're just hoping that you will vote correctly. Number eight, think big. There's a group of people who work on the science of scarcity. And it started with uh, Ansel Keys at the University of Minnesota during the Second World War, who had conscientious objectors that he starved. And then he figured out what it is that would bring them most quickly back to feeling healthy again. And he put out a thousand page book on this, and I happened to have gone through this years ago because I was involved in the relief action in Biafra, Nigeria during the uh, Civil War there. And there's a footnote in there that I totally missed, but these scholars uh, talk about the footnote saying pretty soon that's all these conscientious objectors could talk about was food. And they ch traded recipes, and they were cutting things out of books all the time. And so these people at Harvard started looking at the science of scarcity. And they said it doesn't matter whether the scarcity is food or water or sex or power, that if, or poverty, if deprived, it changes the way people think and it changes their brain structure. And they said, give us a rich person, allow us to make that person poor, and in a month that person will be thinking like a poor person. And so I think back now, 40 years ago, those of us in global health thought like poor people. We could not have a big vision because all of the time we had inadequate resources and it was always a struggle. How much can we do with what we have? So it wasn't what might be needed to do this and how do we raise those funds. All of this changed 19 years ago because of the Gates family. And we still don't have enough money for everything we want to do, but it's changed the way we think that we actually can look at a problem and what would it cost to correct this problem and then start thinking, is it even possible to get those resources? So let me depart briefly from what I hope to say at the Gates Foundation to talk about a couple things that apply to you and then I'll go back for the last two things for the Gates Foundation, challenges. If you want to do important work, you have to work on important problems. And you now are getting a background in global health that allows you to do so many things you can't even imagine what might present in the future. But you have the luxury to actually choose what you do, choose important problems. In this very building, we have President Carter who brought together the idea of mixing politics and global health. 
And when you look at what he was able to do with river blindness and trachoma and guinea worm and, and so forth, this really changed the way we did global health. So it was equivalent to the Gates family now with money and the Carters now saying, how do we use politics? It may seem far away from your interests, but start thinking about political science. I used to get so angry when politicians would make decisions that were not in the interest of public health. I guess I still do. But <laughs> my, uh, my uh, deputy came to me one day when I was so angry about a decision and he said, well, it's all your fault. And I said, what do you mean? He said, if you were really thinking ahead of time, what do they need in order to make good decisions? That's where you would be putting your efforts. So it took me to a second stage and we tried to figure out what it is politicians needed. And I can tell you that it is labor intensive because the politicians turn over, the problems turn over. And so I came to the third stage in my evolution, get public health people to go into politics. And it changes everything. From right from the beginning, you have people that are thinking the way you're thinking. Some of you should go into politics and start thinking about that now. There are real problems. Inequity is a continuing problem in the world. And we look to you to solve it because uh, we have not been very good at that. And don't look to the United States for answers. Uh, if there's anything that is disgusting in our medical care system, it's that we spend more per person than any other country, and we're not even in the top 25 when it comes to outcomes, health outcomes. And the reason is we believe it takes the marketplace to deliver health. But when profit becomes the bottom line, it is very difficult to get equity. And so we talk about a single, single payer system which no one is going to accept in this country because they say it's socialism. But those very same people don't understand that our military budget is a single payer system. And then the military uses the marketplace to buy goods and services. There's no reason health couldn't do the same thing. And I won't get stuck on this, but I must say that we have a dysfunctional global system for health. And while we were very critical of the way WHO handled Ebola, and we should have been critical, it wasn't their fault. You see, WHO was set up in order to do certain things, and it was the United States that insisted on strong regional offices because the United States was trying to protect the Pan American Health Organization. And the regional offices became so strong, they can do what they want, and they can undermine Geneva anytime they want. So it's hard to have a an international uh, system. And then we saddled WHO with a board of directors of 195 ministers of health. Now, no CEO would take over a company with a board that big, with people who change every few years. And so their investment is not really in WHO. It's where is my Minister of Health status going to take me next? And then if that isn't enough, the United States, like every other country, every year tells them to reduce their budget. Then they get a problem like Ebola and they cannot respond to it and everyone says, what's wrong with the system? We're what's wrong with that system. And it's time that the head of UNICEF and WHO and the World Bank and UNDP say, okay, we have 70 years of experience. How do we wish we had set things up? And then try to change them now instead of each year just continuing as we did before. I, I often tell the story of being so disgusted with our government when we were not even meeting our fair share of the WHO budget. And so I wrote an editorial where I quoted Dolly Parton. And Dolly Parton said, you'd be surprised how much it costs to look this cheap. <laughs> and Ebola finally showed us how much it costs to be so cheap. Your future. Everything you do in the future will be done as part of a coalition. 
you won't, you won't do anything on your own. It'll be part of a coalition. So that everything's done by a coalition. Most of them are average coalitions, but some are really great. We know some of the lessons now of the great ones. The great ones start with a definition of the last mile. They don't start by people saying, okay, we're this religious group or we're in this political group, what should we be doing? It starts with a definition of the last mile and now everyone knows what they've signed up for when they join that coalition. We know that it takes ego suppression of the leader. And I tell public health students that business schools may have a different concept of leadership and management, but in public health, I can tell you the leader is the one that can make a coalition actually work and be functional and be productive. And so learn the rules for coalitions. And as you do, know that you always need to know the truth. You can't correct things hoping something will be the case. You have to know what the case is. So seek the truth, it's essential. Know the limits of science. Now I really do enjoy science. And for that reason, I try to get the New York Times every Tuesday morning because of the Science Times. But there's something better than science. And that's science with a moral compass. It's science that is trying to improve the future. And it's science in the service of humanity. And so look for that. Know the limits of science. Rabelais once said, science without conscience is but the ruin of the soul. How people treat each other is the definition of civilization. And now I'd like to go back to the last two points that I'll talk about with the Gates Foundation. Both of these points I used last year with the Fulbright Scholars. And one of them comes from a talk I was asked to give at Emory to the Board of Trustees. And they wanted me to talk on what did I hope our children got out of college. The night before, I was reading Kipling. Now Kipling can be so intriguing. He can condense things down and you get very excited, but he can also be very, very irritating. And what I read the night before was very irritating. And the talk slid north, and the talk slid south. With the sliding puffs of the hookah mouth, four things greater than all things are, women and horses and power and war. And I thought, that's not what I want our children to learn. And so that night, I attempted to rewrite Kipling. And I wrote, and the talk slid east, and the talk slid west. And a student asked, what life is best? Four things treasure all else above, purpose and faith and wisdom and love. And then I ended, point number 10, with one sentence from the book Cutting for Stone. Home is not where you are from. Home is where you are needed. And I just hope you all find your way home. Thank you.